Thanks a lot. Hi everyone, welcome. We'll just get started in a, a minute or two. Just let people join the call. <clears throat> All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Rebecca Penn and uh, I am joining you from Soka Kingdom in um, Mc which is in McMackey, which is the area that is colonially known as Shelburne, Nova Scotia. I'm the project manager of the National Safer Supply Community Practice, and I'm uh, really happy to have you all here today for this uh, launch of a community report. Um, before we get started, um, I uh, do want to do an acknowledgement of uh, the role of colonialism in our past and our present. Just acknowledging that uh, everyone joining us today, you're joining us from across Turtle Island and as people who are uh, living on lands uh, that are treaty lands and unceded territories and want to acknowledge that uh, the work that we are all involved in doing is, is uh, connected to the social harms that are produced through ongoing colonial practices and um, that this, these practices uh, which are not just part of our history, but our ongoing processes and uh, have shaped the way that uh, the world works today. Um, and that our work that we do each day is around addressing the harms that result uh, from colonialism. Uh, I'd like to pass it over to Ashley Smoke now to get the meeting started in a good way. Hi. Hi, my name is Ashley Smoke. My spirit name is Gatherer of Medicines for the People. Um, and it kind of goes with my work at OHAS and NASCOP as the Indigenous Harm Reduction Knowledge Mobilizer. I think I like to think that I bring knowledge and medicine to the people and they bring knowledge and medicine to me. So I get to learn from all kinds of amazing people in our communities and I get to teach people and learn about harm reduction in different communities and what that looks like. So I feel very honored and blessed to be able to do that. Um, I'm here today because I've been asked to open us up and acknowledge the land that we find ourselves gathered on. Even though we're still in this virtual space and spread out, we still find ourselves all on Turtle Island. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge that we live, work, and play here on Turtle Island um, on the many ceded and unceded lands and territories covered by all the various treaties and um, Indigenous communities. But above all that, I would like to acknowledge the actual land and the waters that hold us and ground us um, and the stewards of those lands the many Indigenous communities responsible or tasked with caring for the lands and the Indigenous women responsible for caring for the water. Um, like an example of how this has impacted our communities is the state of like mi missing and murdered Indigenous women and the fact that they're, they are the ones tasked with taking care of the water and just the fact that we have so many missing women and so many murdered women is kind of interesting that our water is in such horrible shape while we have that kind of epidemic going. But yeah, I, I'd like to also remind us all to be thankful for the land and not just acknowledge it, but be grateful for it and all the beauty and all the things that help ground us and the land that we get to walk on and live on and own our houses on, even on rainy overcast days. Um, well, it was like that here. <laughs> um, water is life. So it, even though it's an inconvenience, I think it's nice to just remember it and acknowledge it, thank it, because it's a living thing too. And it has a spirit just like us. 
So going into this webinar, I'd like to thank the land. Sorry, my kid is trying to break in. I'd like to thank the land for providing us safety and healing, much like our guests today, that like they do for our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley. Okay, so for those of you who are joining us today who aren't familiar with the community of practice, let me give you a really quick um, uh, introduction. Uh, we are funded by Health Canada Substance Use and Addictions Program, and we're a collaboration between the um, London Intercommunity Health Centre, uh, the Alliance for People Who Use Drugs, um, and um, the, uh, sorry, Alliance for Healthier Communities, the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs, and the Ontario Aboriginal HIV AIDS Strategy. I need to add that to our slide, sorry about that. Uh, we, our work is capacity building and knowledge exchange, uh, largely focusing around um, uh, safer supply programs. And if you'd like to find out more about our work, you can go to our website. Uh, and we have a lot of, um, resources there, uh, including protocols and um, previous webinars and all kinds of things. So I recommend you go check out our website. Um, and just a little bit about the uh, webinar today, we are recording this event and we will be posting this along with uh, resources connected to the web um, to the topic here today that will all be posted on our website. If you're having difficulties um, with your sound or, or any aspect there, you can just log out and rejoin. Sometimes just doing that solves all the problems. We do have closed captioning available in English. Um, and we also have um, both the chat function um, working and a question and answer box as well. So if you want to chat, uh, make comments to, um, to the whole community, you can put that in the chat box. If you have some specific questions for our presenters, you can put that in the Q&A and uh, we'll get to that during the Q&A section of our uh, of our, of our webinar together. And um, we will be doing a poll about halfway through and it'd be great if you could just uh, reply to that very quick poll. It's helpful for our, our uh, programming. We do have a certificate of attendance that's available. Um, we'll be popping a, a link in the chat about halfway through and you can follow that link and um, it will generate a, um, a certificate for you. I uh, want to just give a quick shout out to our August um, research spotlight, uh, Women's Experiences in Injectable Opioid Agonist Treatment Programs in Vancouver. We have Samara Mayer and Jules Chapman coming to talk about that. That's Monday, August the 12th at 3 p.m. And again, to find out more about the community practice, you can go to our website. And now let me pass it on to Rose and Carol and Adrian and Nat and Emmett. Um, thank you. Just bear with me a sec. Okay. Are you seeing the projected slide? No? No, we see the presenter one. Okay. Worked a minute ago. Sorry about this. Yeah, often if you start the slideshow first, it'll give you that option among the things to share, and that can be smoother <laughs> sometimes if we're lucky. How about now? Okay, super. Um, so uh, Rebecca and uh, Ashley, thank you for um, that uh, opening, the land acknowledgement and for the uh, invitation uh, to present today. Um, hi, everyone else joining us. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, thank you for coming to the launch of a prescription for safety, a study of safer opioid supply programs uh, in Ontario. Uh, so my name is Adrian. Uh, I'm an associate professor in the School of Social Work uh, at the University of Windsor and the co-lead uh, on the project that we'll be discussing today. 
I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Professor Carol Strike from the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, who led the project, uh, Rose Schmidt, uh, a PhD candidate who coordinated the project, um, and Nat uh, Kaminsky, who is a researcher on the project and also and is also the president of the Ontario Network of People Who Use Drugs. We'll all be presenting uh, various uh, aspects of the report, and that will also provide a community leader's perspective and update. Uh, we're also joined by Emmett O'Reilly, a primary health care nurse practitioner at South Riverdale Community Health Center, who is also a member of the research team, and will provide a practice update to kind of weigh in on some things that have changed uh, since we did this work, because it's been a few years. Um, this is what uh, the report looks like, um, and today we'll, we'll cover some key sections, uh, project background, um, the evaluation, um, the, which programs we evaluated, the methods, some key findings, and recommendations, and again, uh, a bit of an update. Um, so I want to do a, a bit of story time and kind of take you back to July 3rd of 2019. Uh, keeping in mind that it's uh, July 24th of 2023 today. So uh, it, it's, it's been a while. Uh, I, I'm channeling like Sophia Petrillo here and sort of like picture it, Toronto, summer 2019. Um, I was attending a series of meetings at the Dalalana School of Public Health related to various projects uh, that I was involved in. And I was uh, serendipitously uh, pulled into an event that morning organized by uh, Dr. Jillian Kola, Dr. Nanki Ray, and Dr. Andrea Sereda. And these are names that many of you will be familiar with. And apologies if I'm forgetting anyone. Um, I'm sort of working from memory. And they were discussing formalized safer supply prescribing. Um, you know, could we be doing this in Toronto? And this was following the Kaput Safe Supply Concept document, which was released earlier that year. And based on the success of Andrea and Nanki's uh, practice experience, uh, which they shared that morning. And the room was full of local researchers and healthcare providers, in including addictions medicine folks and harm reduction providers, and, and just other people who cared and wanted to do something about the growing number of drug poisoning deaths at the time, which unfortunately have, have continued uh, to increase. I remember looking around the room and seeing everyone's reactions. You could sort of see the wheels turning. Is this doable within sort of the relevant regulatory frameworks? Um, what should it look like? Is it sustainable? And many other important questions that were discussed that morning. For my part, I was excited about the potential. It felt like something very important was happening in that room, you know, a, a, a paradigm shift in care. And, and I thought to myself, you know, I hope I can contribute in some small way to this important work. After the morning meeting, some of the uh, clinicians uh, went off and wrote prescribing guidelines. And Carol and I were looped back into a conversation about research and evaluation. And I thought, ah, okay, might be able to help with this. Um, I noticed that the uh, Ontario HIV Treatment Network had a competition which was accepting letters of intent very detailed letters of intent, uh, basically proposals, uh, due the following Tuesday. And um, we heard earlier from Andrea about the positive outcomes for folks who are living with HIV uh, from her program, so it seemed like a good fit uh, for that funder. So uh, we changed our plans over the next few days, sort of pivoted, uh, a term that we've all grown to dislike over the last few years, but uh, we did, and, uh, and we made it happen. Uh, by the following Tuesday. Um, all of the sections of the grant, the signatures, everybody uh, pulled together. Um, if you're wondering about the an initial title of the project, Emergency Safer Supply Programs, the discussion that day was very much framed around safer supply being an emergency intervention to address a public health emergency. And we were worried that the grant reviewers might question the sustainability of this, right? So what if it gets shut down tomorrow and we don't have anything to evaluate? Um, of course, that hasn't happened uh, despite attempts uh, and safer supply has only grown since then. We were subsequently invited to uh, submit a full proposal uh, in October and we received a notice um, that we'd been funded 
at the end of February of 2020. So I remember being very excited uh, and wanting to get started. Uh, the universe had some other plans. So uh, I'm not going to um, go into too much detail here, except to say that 2020 and 2021 uh, didn't work out as many of us had uh, expected or, or hoped. Um, and in terms of the project, we had a lot of challenges and some false starts kind of along the way, getting the research uh, going uh, because of uh, pandemic related public health orders. So stay at home orders, which came and went um, and uh, staged reopenings. Um, I recall seeing some uh, reporting at one point that said Ontario had the longest continuous lockdown uh, in the world. So in, in addition to the public health orders, we also had to contend uh, with research activities um, being suspended uh, at most universities um, and then needing to navigate not only ethics review, but also um, new safety committees, which many universities had uh, implemented. We were able to do some of the interviews over the phone, but we had to uh, wait until September of 2021 um, for in-person interviews to resume. And in-person in interviews are of course very important for reaching the many community members um, who don't have access to phones or, or internet. Um, our partner sites were Intercommunity Health Center, London, Parkdale Queen West Community Health Center, both sites, uh, South Riverdale Community Health Center, and Street Health. Uh, they all offer tablet hydromorphone prescribing with wraparound primary care and system uh, navigation. Their names are shared with permission and they were instrumental in supporting this work. Although we were seriously delayed, um, this coincided with SUAP funding becoming available in 2020, and many of the programs actually grew uh, during this period. By the time we started data collection, many of the programs had expanded their staffing levels and the number of clients they were serving. So this is just a bit of a, a snapshot in time um, from 2021. So Parkdale had about 92 uh, clients, six prescribers and uh, eight allied health professionals, Seth Riverdale 46, one prescriber and two allied health, uh, Street Health 31, one prescriber, two allied health, and London was the largest uh, program with uh, 247 clients at the time and uh, two prescribers and uh, 10 allied uh, health professionals. Just uh, a bit about methods. And I'll, I'll keep it very high level. Um, we conducted semi-structured interviews with 27 safer supply prescribers, so uh, physicians and nurse practitioners, um, allied health, sort of defined broadly to include everyone in the continuum of care within these programs. And it was very clear that uh, these were very well integrated uh, teams and then also some pharmacists who were willing to, to talk with us. And most importantly, uh, 52 uh, clients uh, who, shared, um, who shared their experiences uh, in these programs. The interviews were conducted in person uh, via Zoom and telephone and were audio recorded and transcribed. Um, okay, uh, I'm going, thank you, and I'll pass it over to Nat. And Nat, I will uh, remain the slide clicker so you can just say next. Thanks, Adrian. Next. <laughs> uh, so, uh, like when I was introduced, uh, I, I was the researcher on the team at U of T. Um, and part of what I really enjoyed about the project was the engagement with people who use drugs throughout this. So we had a community advisory board, which uh, was made up of people who were either waiting for the program on the program uh, or oh, I said waiting, yeah. People on the program are waiting to be on the program. Uh, we met five times over the project, provided input on, re they provided input on research, uh, the data collection tools that we were using uh, and throughout like our process and the pivots that we are making. Folks came from the various programs that were involved in Toronto and London, uh, and they provided input on the draft reports uh, that we 
had. Next. Uh, so participants, we interviewed 52 clients across the four programs. Uh, it, London, 40% of the interviews are done. Parkdale Queen West, 30%. South Riverdale, 20 And Street Health, 10 uh, 56% of folks identified as men and 44% identified as women. Uh, the average age was 47, but they ranged from 29 to 62. And the ethnicity was broken down to 79% white, 17% indigenous, 2% ACB, and 2% Latino. Uh, of the folks interviewed, seven folks were HIV positive, all were currently on medication, and all on all had undetectable viral loads and 77% of the clients had never received a hepatitis C positive diagnosis. Next, I think I'm passing to someone now. <laughs> Am I passing to someone now? Yes, yes. Sure, I can take it from here. Um, so, most of the clients had some previous engagement with a substance use service. Um, um, uh, Eighty-seven percent had used methadone, uh, been on a methadone program in the past, um, and fifty percent had been to some sort of uh, live-in or inpatient uh, uh, treatment program. Most were not currently using um, a use of uh, opioid agonist treatment, so seventy percent were not currently uh, using one, and. Um, a fair number of people had reported uh, that they um, used an opioid other than their uh, safer supply in the last in the last month. Next. So as Adrian said, we we interviewed twenty seven service providers. So that's twenty one people in the programs, as well as six uh, pharmacists. Um, over half of the service providers identified as women. And they had a fair amount of experience, uh, around 60% had between six and 10 years of experience uh, working with people who use drugs. Next. So when we did um, thematic analysis, we, we looked at sort of what were the key things that, uh, that were coming out of, of uh, what people told us. So for the report, we focused on five major themes that we kept seeing coming up in interviews. Next. The first one was that safer supply programs saved lives. <clears throat> So before joining the program, uh, most clients had experienced multiple and frequent overdoses. However, since starting the program, many clients reported that they'd either not overdosed or that they were overdosing significantly less frequently. We heard over and over again, people tell us that the program saved their lives. Having a steady access to a safe supply of opioids also helped participants manage their withdrawal symptoms. Many clients also told us that they were changing the way that they used opioids. So, for example, some people reported that they switched from injecting to either only or mostly swallowing their prescription instead. Some clients also reported that they reduced uh, the frequency or the quantity of unregulated drugs that they were using. And some people reported that they had stopped using uh, drugs other than their safer supply altogether, even though that was not a goal of the program. Next. So we have a few uh, quotations sprinkled throughout. Uh, I don't think I'd still be here. I think I'd be dead by now. It saved my life and it's going to save my life. I don't know where I'd be today without this program. That's uh, from one of the clients of the programs. Next. So the second major theme we found um, was that these programs were really adaptable and they were very flexible. Um, as Adrian mentioned, all of the programs that we were that were included in the study provided wraparound primary care in addition to the uh, safer supply prescription. There were differences in how these programs operated. You saw that some of them had much larger teams and they had services in house, whereas others had uh, quite small teams of just three people. And they wound up relying on organizations outside of their uh, other organizations to provide some of these some uh, some other services to their clients. However, uh, despite that, across all the programs, some key approaches were used and key approaches uh, uh, 
included um, being client-centered, being trauma-informed, and being harm reduction-oriented. The programs were very flexible and the clients were drivers of their own care plans. And this allowed the client or the programs to account for the complex needs of many of the people in the programs. Across the program, service providers told us that yes, prescribing opioids is important and it reduces overdoses, but they also told us that the relationships that they were building with clients helped clients to feel safe enough to trust healthcare and social supports again. And clients similarly told us that the caring service providers and the relationships that were built on mutual respect were really key to the success of the program. Next. So this is from an allied health provider. We introduce, we reintroduce healthcare. We do full primary care, full social support. We really try to integrate ourselves into every part of our patients' lives and help with anything and everything we can based on their own goals and what they want. Next. So related to that was that the SOS programs, the Safer Supply programs improved health as well as the access to healthcare. So we know that many people who use drugs have had negative experiences with healthcare and with substance use treatment services in the past. And these negative experiences can really be heightened for women and gender diverse people, as well as indigenous people, people with disabilities, and members of the African, Caribbean, Caribbean and Black community. Um, by meeting the needs of the clients and honoring and the value of their lives and valuing their dignity and demonstrating care for their well being, using those principles I mentioned the client centered care, the trauma informed practice, harm reduction, these, the Safer Supply programs really helped build trust and to re-engage people with the healthcare system. As a result, many clients told us that they were healthier now. Um, they noted specific improvements in their physical health, like having better pain management, being better able to stick to medications for conditions like diabetes or HIV, um, particularly when these medications were dispensed at the pharmacy as the, at the same time as their safe supply. Um, they reported having reduced infections and re re sorry, injection related complications like endocarditis. Um, a number of people told us that they had started addressing or completing long outstanding diagnostics or screening like my mammograms, um, as well as having things like better sleep and improved mobility, more energy. Um, clients also reported a positive impact on their mental health, um, including a reduced social isolation, less stress, less fear and worry and an improved mood. Uh, the programs also help clients uh, access other services. So through system navigation, help them connect with uh, healthcare, social supports and harm reduction services uh, like HIV testing as well as dental care, safe consumption sites, uh, those sorts of things. Next. So this is from a client, I got my eyes done, my dental's being done, I have problems, problems from head to toe, yet they work with me. Next. So related, SOS program uh, clients and staff told us that clients had an improved quality of life uh, by, by participating in these programs. They had increased stability and they'd in, uh, improved uh, social determinants of health. Most clients described that before they uh, had participated in the Safer Supply Program, they were stuck in a cycle of doing survival activities that are criminalized, um, like sex work and stealing, to get money, and then buying drugs, and then using drugs, and then going back to make money. But the Safer Supply Program helped break this cycle. The cycle had made it hard to work towards other goals and to work uh, to take part in other life activities. Most clients also said that they now had improved personal finances because they no longer were spending all their money on unregulated drugs. Clients uh, described that the program led to increased stability like housing and food security, although many noted how difficult it was to find aff affordable and appropriate housing in both Toronto and London. Some clients told us that they had improved relationships with their friends and family. Um, many told us that they no longer had to do things for money that they didn't want to do. Um, 
and that they had money for other things, like they had money for food and going out, computers, cell phones, making plans. Some clients told us that because of the safe supply, they were able to return to work or to start work or to start volunteering. And for many clients, the program had really changed how they viewed themselves and had improved their outlook on life. So for example, being able to participate actively in their life made them feel more responsible. Next. This is from a client. I've seen how my life drastically changed. I have a job, I have an apartment, I have bills I pay for, I have a car, I have real life responsibilities that I never had before. And all this is because of the program. Next. And finally, we heard from service providers that delivering the SOS programs was challenging, but it was very rewarding. So the programs faced many challenges, as, I, as we've said, that they were very small programs and they were trying to address a very big and very complex problem. And there's a lot of people who are in need of support. Um, the smallest num number of staff did make it difficult to do things like uh, handle absences and sick leaves. And while staff uh, compensated for these challenges, this could lead to uh, burnout. We know that the pandemic increased opioid related harms and death. Uh, and there was a high demand for these programs at the time as there continues to be now. Um, so as a reminder, the data was collected in 2021. Um, and we heard that the public health strategies that were put in place to reduce tr uh, the transmission of COVID-19 had been causing some pro problems for the programs, such as having to limit the number of people in waiting rooms, which resulted in and, and long wait times and limited capacity to enroll new clients. Programs implemented strategies to try and manage the increased demand by doing things like focusing on the highest need clients first, uh, making changes to wait lists, like focusing on uh, same day admissions. But by focusing on the highest need clients, it wound up taking longer to stabilize the clients' doses, as well as address many of their health needs. Um, and as a result, this made that the programs took longer to have the capacity to enroll new clients. This is important because while they were waiting to be enrolled in a program, there is the potential that someone might overdose. Um, and they also might have higher needs when they are accepted into the program. Despite these challenges, staffs the staff persisted. They were able to stabilize clients on safer supply. And staff described the work as very rewarding. They observed how the programs were really helping people who use drugs and that they were really proud of their role in these changes. Next. A physician, really feeling a sense of control over their lives as well as their bodies and their own health, which I think has been really rewarding to witness and to be able to support. And I'll pass it over to Carol, who will tell you uh, some of the recommendations that we heard. Next slide, Adrian, please. Thanks, and one more. Um, so uh, we asked all of the participants. Um, people who were on the programs and people who were delivering the programs, what they would recommend to make the programs better. And uh, these are some of the things that they told us. Um, they talked a lot about uh, providing more options for safer supply. So uh, they talked about having a wider range of medications that they could prescribe or receive. Uh, so people talked to us about how they wanted injectable hydromorphone. Um, uh, people also talked to us about how they actually preferred heroin and they'd like to be able to access that through the program. Uh, some people wanted uh, access to fentanyl, prescribed fentanyl, uh, because uh, they liked it and or they had a tolerance that um, was very high and couldn't they, they found they couldn't quite meet their tolerance with the uh, hydromorphone they were getting. And some wanted access to stimulants uh, that not through the safe, uh, not through the street supply, which was contaminated. And they believed that it was important in terms of their health to have access to a safe supply of stimulants uh, and the like. And if you go to the next slide, Adrian, uh, someone talks about, you know, why they wanted heroin. So uh, someone told us, you know, their drug of choice would be heroin. If I could get heroin, I'd be happy. I know it's got lots of legs and I enjoy the high. Uh, and they felt that, you know, the dilated was, um, was different uh, and they would have preferred having heroin. Next slide, please. 
Um, people also talk to us about getting a uh, safe supply through different ways. Um, uh, people enjoyed uh, their, their time in the program um, and many wanted to stay, but some also talked about wanting other ways to get safe supply. So those included, you know, um, perhaps a, a more nuanced discussion of legalization of drugs and availability of compassion clubs, because there was a concern from prescribers and people on the program that uh, they knew people who couldn't get in because uh, of the limitations of the program. Um, and some people, even if they could get in, didn't want in because they didn't want to be part of a medicalized model um, because of prior experience in, in medicalized environments uh, or for other reasons. Um, and people talked about, you know, that by providing a wider range of options, it would increase the uh, accessibility of a safer supply uh, through these different models. And People also pointed out to us that um, that safer supply programs may still have some barriers for people who are pregnant, uh, people who are parenting, and that um, uh, specific programming was necessary for these groups in particular. Next slide. Thanks. Um, as this one physician said, uh, I would personally love it if we had gr a grassroots version of safe supply where people who use drugs were actually able to have access to legalized tested substances, uh, not just like decriminalization, but actually talking about legalization in a nuanced way. Next slide, please. Um, and, you know, uh, pretty much every day in the news, there's a story about the housing affordability crisis across Ontario, and this was was an issue and still is an issue from what I understand for the programs about uh, housing, um, that housing is really important for people in terms of improving their overall well-being, and that yeah, even though people want to do really well in these programs, sometimes lacking um, a, a, a secure uh, and safe housing impeded their ability to get as much as they possibly could out of the programs. And they really wanted more options. Uh, and they found that there were limited options in the, the cities that where we did our study. And that's not you know, specific to these cities at all in Canada. Um, and uh, providers also talked about how the housing shortage and the insecurity in housing um, hampered their connection to the program and also their ability to interact with their clients because sometimes they were hard to find. You know, if you think about people being moved out of a shelter to another side of the city, um, losing their cell phone or whatever, and it's hard to find them. And it's also hard for people to come to the programs and now they have to pay for transit and the like. And the, how um, the housing was really becoming impediment for some people um, to do better than they already were doing in the programs. Next slide, please. So as this uh, uh, quote says, you know, um, we have housing finders. So it wasn't that, you know, they couldn't have people to help people find uh, clients, but as they said, but we have no housing and the housing we have is wildly unaffordable. Next slide, please. Um, a lot of people talked about the necessity of expanding the size and the reach of the programs. Um, so a, a lot of these programs, you know, had a small staff complement, they had limited budgets. Uh, they felt that they could do more, uh, but they couldn't in, in terms of their current model. And also, as Rose was saying earlier, uh, some of them took, because of their limitations, they took the very most at need people, which meant that it was harder for them to bring in more people because it took a longer time to help people um, stabilize and, and move forward in the program. So, um, uh, Participants told us a lot about the need for more fa family doctors uh, and also nurse practitioners who are willing to prescribe safe supply. Um, this would help increase the capacity of the teams. It would also provide an opportunity for some of them to take a leave, to go on vacation because they didn't have coverage for those types of things. They also wanted more uh, opportunities to provide enhanced client support, like particularly mental health and including uh, trauma-informed counseling. And they wanted to increase their peer programming uh, with uh, more connections and more navigation, but they faced some limitations in terms of their budgets. And some of them just plain lack space and they wanted more opportunities to, you know, uh, have space where they were and also more spaces in particular across um, their geographic location where they were so they could uh, provide coverage to a wider range of um, a uh, greater number of clients. Next slide. 
So as this physician said, we need more capacity, more prescribers, because safe supply is almost like a boutique program. Uh, and the next, uh, my last slide, I think it's my second last slide. Um, and um, a lot of people talked to us about sustainability. Uh, there was a lot of concern about the sustainability of the programs in terms of their size and their ability to uh, provide the, the range of care that they wanted for their clients. Um, they also recognized that expanding and also providing some security for this program was going to require a lot of support at the uh, for in terms of funding uh, and political and community support uh, that, that, you know, they need more funding and they need support for getting more funding. And that to do that, there need to be a lot of advocacy and education about the impact of these programs and the need for the programs uh, moving forward. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as one client said, my only issue with this program is that it's not far reaching enough. I feel so badly when I see that people aren't on the program that want to get in. That's my only concern. And this is a, we heard this repeatedly from all different kinds of participants. Um, and now I'm going to turn you over to Emmett. We're going to, we're going to start with Nat. Oh, sorry. So as I said in the beginning, part of what I love work, do uh, what I love about working at U of T is that I've been able to see how community is involved throughout research, whether it's part of advisory boards or actually being on the research team, helping develop the plan. And so additionally, you know, as on the Ontario network of people who use drugs. And from being a part of CAPID membership, people who use drugs need to be involved at all levels in programming and delivering programming to our community, helping to shape it into something that we want and need. So much like the recommendations that we heard in the study, people who use drugs across Canada are calling for people with power and privilege to join us in our fight for decrim. We are often putting our own community care models out trying to ensure that we're reaching folks who need as need support. And so there's different models from Ontario all the way to BC of people who use drugs, starting compassion clubs and getting involved in the advocacy. And so that would just be the additional recommendations that I would have if you're doing this work for you to participate in some of the work that we as people who use drugs across the country are doing and fighting for. I can pass it to Emmett now, I think. Hi, uh, my name is Emmett. I'm a nurse practitioner from South Riverdale. Um, can people see me? I don't seem to have my, yeah, maybe. Okay. Um, so yeah, I was just gonna go over a few things that, uh, that have uh, come up uh, since the study and have remained the same since the study. Um, I think I'll stick with the, uh, I'll start with the ongoing issues. Like funding continues to be a challenge for us. Uh, Many of the programs that are doing safe supply now in a sort of coordinated way are funded through the substance use and addiction program, which is a federal program. Uh, unfortunately, it only really is offering uh, one year, um, some places have two year, but usually just one year uh, funding, which makes staffing particularly challenging because if you're trying to invite somebody to do this new type of prescribing, um, it's uh, it's hard to get them to commit to you know tooling up for a new type of practice if they don't know if they're gonna have a job doing that the next year. Um, it's especially hard if we lose people midway through the year because then you're looking to cover contracts for you know six months, which is not really particularly appealing to uh, is not a particularly appealing offer. Uh, other ongoing challenges remain um, with our medications. Uh, you know, as uh, Carol said, I think the some people noted that they would really like to have fentanyl, they'd really like to have prescription heroin, they'd really like to have access to a lot of these other drugs, and so would we. Uh, the biggest issue is not that the drugs are not uh, available, it's that they're not accessible because the we rely on uh, provincial funding to get the uh, to get the drugs paid for. Otherwise, it would just sink our programs to have to pay for all those meds. So until those medications get some form of external funding, we won't be able to cover them, uh, which is which is a real shame and something we're we're working towards. Um, we are also um, having uh, still having some challenges with uh, recruiting and retaining clients. 
um, of certain demographics like indigenous women are particularly um, have been we have been particularly unsuccessful in keeping in the program, although we've had some success in getting them engaged initially. Um, one thing that we're hearing is that we need to change the, our delivery methods, um, which is something else that was noted in the study. So we have started doing more group programming um, as well as uh, offering, uh, we're working on offering some after hours programming. Uh, that's some of the stuff that has changed. So the study took place in COVID, which really restricted a lot of our opportunities in terms of uh, care delivery models. Um, so since COVID, we've been able to uh, open up to group-based programming. So having more than, you know, two people in a room, which is nice. So for South Riverdale, we started um, a seeking safety group, which is a trauma-based group. That's like a closed group. So people enroll, but we also have an informal drop-in group for people who are less interested or less, uh, less able to commit long-term to a program. Um, as I said, we're also working on an after hours program um, that will be women only because that's one thing that we heard from a lot of our female identified clients is that the nine to five hours simply weren't getting, uh, weren't, weren't good enough for, uh, or we didn't meet their needs and their availability. So that's been a significant challenge for us. Uh, some other things we have, um, mobile teams have started to uh, become part of our practice. So we have, uh, South Riverdale has a mobile team um, and uh, Parkdale Queen West also has a mobile team, which is, allows us to reach people. Like our mobile team now goes further east in Toronto because we're at the east end of Toronto and uh, the center of Toronto and the west of Toronto is fairly well served. but. Um, a lot of gentrification has displaced a lot of the drug using populations further east into places like Scarborough. And so now we're able to better serve them, which has been a, which has been a fantastic addition to our, uh, to our offerings. Uh, there's a new intake process, which is, I don't know, I guess I'm a little more ambivalent about this one. There's a centralized uh, online referral uh, process through a program called Ocean, which allows people to refer um, online. Uh, it's still it's still a work in progress, so we'll see how that goes. It's not really impacting clients uh, in a significant way. Um, staffing, as I said, continues to be a big problem, as does does burnout. Um, this is this is challenging work, and uh, uh, that wasn't helped uh, particularly by the recent <laughs> high publicity we received through uh, the the fantastic work of the National Post. That's sarcasm in case anyone hasn't met me before. Um, so the National Post article, uh, well, hatch a job, I guess we should call it, um, really did change uh, the conversation around safe supply. It became much less about it, you know, the drug using population and the addictions medicine population talking to each other or past each other. Um, and now it's become a much more high profile issue I think initially there was some fear that it could be sort of disastrous for us as we were, as I said, our funding is very tenuous. Um, and so there was some concern that this might be uh, a sort of an existential threat to safer supply federally. Um, but paradoxically, it seems to have kind of galvanized and mobilized a lot of our supporters. Um, so I think the jury's still out on whether it uh, did us more harm or more good. Um, but we, as I said, we'll see how that, that turns out. I'm cognizant of the time, so I'm going to stop there, but I'm happy to answer any questions that people may have. I don't actually know who I'm handing it to. I think we're just waiting to see. Um, I think there are some questions in the, um, the Q&A. And how do you want us to handle those? Yeah, we've got some questions for you. Um, just before we do that, thanks so much. This is great. And I think we can have a really good conversation um, for the next uh, few minutes. But we're just going to um, do two things. One is, can we put the poll up, please, Paula? If you'll take a moment to uh, fill out that poll for us, that we really appreciate it. Um, but while that's happening, we can continue on. Um, the, we do have a Q&A box. If you have questions for the panel, please put your questions there. And just to go through a few of them, Carol, would you like me to, to, put, the, to put them to the group? That would be good. Yeah, okay. So the first question is, is um, 
regarding the different routes of administration. Uh, was there limits on route of administration of the medications being dispensed? For example, can clients inject, snort, booty bump, uh, or was it strictly oral usage? So we would support people using in any way they chose. The hydromorphone does not smoke, so it is uh, it just burns. Um, so it's not a, it's not inhalable in that sense. But yeah, all of the above um, are things that we support. Uh, injection is obviously the highest risk because of the bloodborne infections. But uh, you know, we talk to people; it's harm reduction. People are going to do what they're going to do, and we're going to support them in that. So we just try to reduce harms around those. Um, oh, if I can add to that, um, uh, our understanding is in the, the programs we looked at at that time, there weren't any restrictions, but uh, our colleague, uh, Mary Lou Gagnon, um, just led a paper looking at uh, reductions in injection. So this was not a requirement of any of the programs, but some of the uh, uh, the, the clients chose for, for various reasons um, to either stop injecting or reduce uh, injecting, uh, you know, just to meet uh, either health or sort of wellness or, or life goals. And uh, I'm happy to share that with uh, anyone who is interested. Just in terms of uh, the way people who use the drugs, as somebody who's on the program, my doctor's done great work in helping me with my own like employer to ensure that our policies allow for me to use my medications the way that I want. Um, and so I would also encourage folks to provide clients with documents so that they can take the medications the way that they want to. Thanks, uh, thanks, Adrian and Robin. Um, slip the link into the into Mary Lou's paper around uh, around the changes in injection practices. Um, there's another question here about the re around um, your research process. Uh, do you have any? Um, is there anything you wished you'd measured or asked the participants? Looking back now, any lessons learned from how you conducted the research? Um, I'll go first and others can chip in as they want, as they may. Um, we had a really hard time getting pharmacists to talk to us. We really like to talk to pharmacists. Uh, we tried just about everything to get pharmacists to talk to us and we, uh, we got a few, but um, pharmacists play a really important role in safe supply. And um, it would be important to understand their perspective on, 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 um, uh, on safe supply. Uh, I will say that uh, when we talked to uh, clients, um, we didn't hear the kinds of things that we have heard in, you know, in studies of other opioid assisted treatment sometimes about their experiences in pharmacies. Um, and so I'm curious, like, what, what's the difference? Like, what's going on that's different uh, for the safe supply um, patients? So that's one thing I would like to have known more about. I don't know about anybody else. Um, I, I think in terms of the, the structures of the interview, we spent um, a lot of time kind of talking to folks about their use and about how they got on the programs um, and, you know, kind of negotiating access and titration and stuff like that. They were much more interested in talking about kind of living with safer supply, having access, how it's, how it's changed their lives. Um, many wanted to share, uh, you know, beautiful powerful stories about how they reconnected with friends and, and family and, and children. And we certainly uh, heard that, but I, I would have liked to go deeper and uh, hopefully we can, we can do that in, in some other um, uh, projects. It was just very much kind of celebrating, um, you know, what they've been able to do and what they hope to do uh, in the future. Great. Hey, um, there's a question here about uh, whether what percentage of clients in the program stop using fentanyl and what percentage are um, using methadone. Uh, is there someone who wants to talk about like the goals of the program and um, and uh, yeah, use yeah. 
I think I think Emma could probably address this. I think what's something that's important to note is those those statistics that we had, like 87% had used methadone in the past, is that we didn't interview everyone in the program, right? It is a qualitative uh, evaluation study. So um, it's hard to know sort of what the overall percentage of people continuing to use methadone are. There's thankfully other kinds of methodologies that are that are getting at those kinds of questions. But I'll let Emmett talk to that uh, point. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the part of the question is what our our goals are. Like, we don't people stopping using fentanyl is not our goal. Our goal is to reduce harms to the community and risks to the community. So, many of our clients continue to use much much smaller amounts of fentanyl. Um, in addition to the quantity of fentanyl used, there is a reduced risk based on the urgency of use. Like a, a lot of people talk about the ability to choose their dealer and choose where they use. Um, because if you know you're not going to go into this like extreme withdrawal because you have your other medication, you can take time, get safer medications uh, or get safer substances and use them in safer places. So as opposed to being in severe withdrawal and having to use in a bathroom or behind a building or wherever, you can take your time and get to a safe space or use with friends, get to an injection site. But to answer your question more straightforwardly, yes, some people do, um, a fair few people do come up. I don't have the statistics um, for all the programs. Um, uh, so a fair few people do stop using fentanyl and switch to safer supply only. Um, and with regard to your question around methadone, methadone is one of the medications we use regularly. We're not, we're not in opposition to methadone. We don't stand in opposition to any of the opioid agonist therapist use. I think, there's actually been an increase, at least in my practice, in interest in methadone. I think there are people are starting to uncouple methadone, the medication from methadone maintenance therapy, the delivery model. Um, so people actually like, because methadone really does cover for 24 hours plus. So for people who have trouble with withdrawal overnight, methadone is very effective. Um, sometimes with our clients, we have to use everything in our arsenal because their tolerances are so high. That's what we need to, uh, to really address it. Um, I just wanted to add, even from like the last question with methadone, we did hear from people, you know, what their experience was vice versa, but it would have been nice to know why some folks didn't continue on their methadone program, especially if they were on methadone on safe supply so that we can provide, you know, some insights and supports for methadone programs to hopefully in the future, be able to look at some of their policy and delivery models because folks were using methadone along their safe supply program. So that's what I wish would have happened. Thanks, Matt. I think that's helpful. There's a couple of questions that relate to supporting people while um, they're on waiting lists. Uh, one question asks if there was a way that um, of staying in touch with folks, uh, were phones given? Um, also, uh, did people receive wraparound services while they were waiting to be uh, eligible for getting the prescriptions? So, no, mostly <laughs> to your questions. Um, we didn't, we at our site anyway, didn't maintain a waiting list for a number of reasons. It's logistically very challenging. It requires a fair bit of, of work from uh, our very our very meager staffing resources. Um, with clients who, who are as mobile um, and, and as, as marginalized as ours, it, it's very hard to keep in touch with people. Contact information changes almost constantly. Um, the only yes answer would be that we were giving out phones during COVID. There were various programs to get phones to people. Um, unfortunately, that kind of coincided with a big boom in benzo dope. And uh, with benzo dope, people were down uh, for very long periods of time and rinsing really became a thing where when people are unconscious for prolonged periods, all of their belongings would be stolen. So people were, became very sort of predatory and opportunistic around that. So we would give phones to people and two days later they'd be back asking for another one. So it, I, in some cases it was super helpful. In many, many cases it was super tough. Um, and in terms of offering wraparound services, if we could offer the wraparound services with the staffing we had, we would certainly have just offered people places in the program. The, the, the limiting factor was we didn't have people to deliver the services. Thanks. Um, 
do you have time for a couple more questions or shall we call it there? Yeah, okay. Um, there, Because there's quite a few questions. We can also follow up with people afterwards. Uh, there's um, a couple of questions that are related to diversion. Um, one question is, um, that uh, there's somebody on the call who um, has experienced some of their patients starting to use illicit hydromorphone, which is which they believe is diverted from safe supply prescriptions. Um, and um, another uh, question also asking about some of the comment conversation around diversion that's happened as part of the backlash against this programming and whether or not this report addresses that in any way. Um, and Yes, I think that summarizes those two questions. So I guess for the first one, if someone was going to use an opiate, uh, it's better that they use something that they know the strength of and can get information around dosing. And so I think if if, if your patients are coming to you and they're they're using a prescription medication, you can easily titrate that. You can support them in that. But if someone's going to use an opiate, whether they're using a medication or they're gonna use street-based fentanyl, they've made that choice to use and you want them to make the safest choice and have access to that. So I don't see it as much of a problem uh, as I guess it's been made out to be because the current supply is poison and all my friends are dead. I wish they would have gotten a Dilata. Thanks, Seth. Yeah, I think it's I think it's important to remember that one of the reasons that Dilaudid was studied in the first place was because it was a very commonly used street drug. That's why it was included in the Naomi and Salumi trials, was because it was something that was commonly used. Um, you know, they're called Dillies. They even got a nickname, right? So, um, to and and I would also be very interested to know how people knew their their uh, hydromorphone was being diverted from a safer supply program. Hydromorphone is a very commonly prescribed substance. Um, it's used in palliative care and prescribed in huge doses and taken out from the pharmacy with very little diversion oversight. So I, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not trying to dismiss the the issue. Uh, but but there is there's a lot of, I think, assumptions being made about where hydromorphone is coming from and who's using it. Um, hydromorphone, I mean, pe people at one hand talk about how inexpensive it is, and then they talk about the diversionary forces. But if, if people aren't getting much money for their hydromorphones, it's not worth selling. So there becomes there becomes a bit of a feedback loop there that 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 doesn't really the logic doesn't totally hold. But um, uh, you know, it, it is an issue and we're, we're, we're alive to it and we're awake to it. I think diversion is much more complex than people are often given credit, it is often given credit for. So we are working. Yeah. Um, if I can add to that, um, in, in, in preparing for today and, uh, you know, looking at, at my notes um, from back in 2019 and seeing those initial prescriber guidelines, you know, diversion was discussed, right? It, it's always been on the table. It's not something that, um, you know, the, the community is, is pretending doesn't exist. And I think there's always a willingness to talk about it. In terms of our study, I can say that when I would ask that question, kind of very, you know, gently, I heard a lot of, no, I need all of this. Like, I need every single one of these pills to get through the day. We did hear a few stories of folks who were in relationships where their partner was on the wait list and had been waiting for a very long time. And in a situation like that, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, you might need to share your medication while that person is waiting to get into a program. So that was very much a minority. Um, and it was often within like, uh, you know, uh, very, very close relationships, um, friends, family who were using and did not have access and, and were in active withdrawal was, was mostly the context. We didn't hear about selling for profit really or anything like that. And I think the rhetoric of like people who use drugs, who need to use fentanyl, targeting people who have never used an opiate with selling of medication for like cheap prices 
nobody I know who uses fentanyl would ever wish that onto somebody else. And people on these programs are working towards, you know, gaining back what they've lost. They understand what opiate addiction is. And so they would they wouldn't take that on in, in a predatory way and bring it to somebody who has never used opiates, who does not want to use opiates. Yeah. We're not drug pushers. <laughs> Thanks, Nat. And I think, you know, one of the things we can always think about is that when we are seeing these things happen, um, that it can be reflective of unmet needs. And uh, so what do we need to do uh, to support people to have the kinds of care, services, medications that, that they need? Um, great. And there's a number of other questions here. I'm thinking that perhaps we can follow up um, on these. Uh, I did um, want to just give a moment for anyone to have any last minute um, comments about where, where you hope to go next, maybe. Um, any other thoughts you'd like to share? We hope to still have funding next spring. That's what we hope for. A late, a late Christmas present from a provincial funding body. Oh, yes. Yes, I think there are a lot of people holding that hope. Um, and it, okay. Joining the advocacy that's happening, um, because I think, you know, the drugs aren't going to get better. The street supply is not going to get better. And these are Band-Aid solutions that we're working on. And, and we need all types of programs and services and supports. But what we need overall is change because our system is not working how it is. So please, to folks who are on this call, join in the advocacy that's happening, work with your local drug user groups and provide us your support. Thank you. I think that's really important to hear that. Thank you. Uh, that's great. All right, then uh, we'll uh, leave it there. Um, we do invite you to get in touch if you have any questions for our panelists or uh, for the community of practice. You will find the report available. It's on our website right now. Um, so you can find that there. And we will also be posting the, uh, the webinar here so you can share it with others. I'm really grateful for this research that's been done. Um, it, uh, it's reflecting what I'm hearing from people in the community. It's echoing some other work that's uh, happening out there. It's the research on safer supply is um, starting to really provide a lot of, uh, a lot of evidence uh, around some of the benefits, some of the challenges and future directions for the work. And I'm really grateful for this team and the work that you've done contributing to that. Uh, great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for having us. Well, yeah, thanks for sticking around.